Hey, everybody, this is Larry the Cable Guy. Check this out. So I'm in my truck driving with my buddy, and we was heading up to the men's warehouse to fart in the suits, and he's listening to his phone. And I said, that sounds like Hermie Sadler. He said, it is Hermie Sadler. He's got a podcast called Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. I said, Sadler and the Senator? He said, yeah, that's his good buddy, Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley. I said, well, what in the world? He didn't know this. I said, did you know that Hermie Sadler was voted one of the 50 best looking drivers in NASCAR? He said, I did not know that. I said, because it ain't true. <laughs> you never know, though. He never takes off his helmet. But I know one thing. This show, Leaning Right, Turning Left, is good. So pull up a chair right there by your phone. Get yourself a cold beer and give a listen right here to this week's episode of Leaning Right, Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. I'll tell you what, I bet Michael Waltrip's even listening. He's always wanted to do something like that. Oh, Sadler, got another one over on Waltrip. Get her done! today thanks larry the cable guy thanks for you listening thanks for the cheering i'm virginia state senator bill stanley i'm learning how to use the computer with my son colin and i'm leaning right and i'm Hermie saddle i'm down in emporia virginia today we are remote and i'm turning left leaning right and turning left is back once again powered by face mad Hermie, how you doing senator how are you well, you know, I'd rather be with you. I think we just broke a streak. We broke the streak of having Shep on a bunch of shows, and now he's still, he's in I a sit-out. Who? Sh- uh, sh- Shep. Shep Moss. Shep Moss is not here again. He's on the walkout. Protesting. What's wrong with Shep? I don't know. What's going on with him? You're closer to him than I am. You're right there at South you Hill. we we'll have to do some investigation. Looks like he may have a... Uh... You right, he traded his in for a better gig or yeah, what? Yeah, maybe there's a Shep Moss podcast out there we just don't know about yet. But he's not here this week, but you don't always need him. We got Hermie, you got me, and we're ready to talk about a lot of things on this podcast this week. We're not taping together, which is breaking the streak. Usually we're, uh, we're sitting across from each other having a good time, and that's what I really like about it. We're back on Riverside, which is you're on, at your place in Emporia. I'm at my law firm here at the Stanley Law Group. At the mothership here in Manita, Virginia, at Smith Mountain Lake, and so we're going to start this off uh, the way we always do, man. I mean, uh, we've had a great week, and we're looking forward to another week. And uh, things are just how things hopping. can change in a week. Yeah, isn't that crazy? I mean, you and I, you know, we own it. For those that are listening for the first time, we're happy to have you. But uh, Hermie and I started a, a race team, an open wheel modified race team, a couple years back, and uh, this year we brought on Bobby Labonte, Ryan Newman. Uh, we had Jonathan Brown, who's a great race car driver, won us a race last year. Last year, we had um, we had Ryan Newman win the return to North Wilkesboro and the revitalization of that old track. First time that rubber hit that road since the 90s. It's really big. And so we had a lot of big plans for this year. And and I guess what it proves in racing is that um, you put everything together and, and, you know, Lady Luck has something to say about it. Uh, she's undefeated. Also, Mother Nature this year, we've had some rainouts, but it's been a tough season for Sadler Stanley racing, hasn't it? Well, the last time, you know, you and I taped uh, on last week's show, we tried to nicely tiptoe around what had been a, just a difficult weekend at the racetrack. You know, we had high expectations going into last weekend's races, uh, two weekends ago's races, which was a return again to North Wilkesboro, this time under the NASCAR Wheeling Modified Tour banner. and then. Uh, Sunday racing at uh, Motor Mile, Pulaski Motorsports Park, uh, up uh, in the western part of the state. And uh, you know, I thought we were well prepared, and our cars were prepared, and we had high expectations. But just tell it like it is, we had a, a tough, tough weekend at the track as far as North Wilkesboro is concerned. Uh, Bobby Labonte uh, had an accident and didn't get the finish we wanted there. Ryan Newman, with 50 laps to go, was leading the race. We come in. We have a terrible pit stop, get back in traffic, get knocked around on a couple of restarts, and we finished six, but still had some considerable damage done to the left front of that race car. So in all intents and purposes, we left North Wilkesboro with no win and two tore up cars. 
And then we go to Pulaski Motorsports Park on Sunday. Not only did we finish second at that track last year, but we've got high expectations because we've got a lot of the brass, you might say, from Pacematic, uh, not only the sponsor of our race team, but also the podcast. They flew in for the race on Sunday and just a another tough, tough day at the racetrack. Bobby Labonte, um, at, you know, really no fault of his own, but got involved in another accident, tore, tore up his car. He was very disappointed and distraught about that. Ryan Newman uh, ran second, third, fourth pretty much all day, ended up uh, blowing a head gasket, and we lost an engine in that car. And just a, you know, just one of those weekends where everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And, and uh, but good news is you and I were able to, you know, we, uh, I went to Charlotte, you hooked up with us by, uh, by by Zoom and, and FaceTime, and we sat down and talked and kind of hit the reset button in a lot of ways at the race shop with our drivers, crews, otherwise, and then we turn around and come back to Tri-County Speedway this past weekend. Jonathan Cash is driving the 39 because Ryan Newman has a commitment with his uh, with his daughter. She races, her, right? She races. Expanding racing career, yeah. yeah, doing really, really good, and really appreciate and understand Ryan's wanting and needing to be involved uh, in her racing career. So he was not at Tri-County, but Jonathan Cash got us a top 10 uh, after running up front, you know, qualified sixth and was up to second and third and ended up uh, falling back to uh, ninth at the finish. But our guy, Bobby Labonte, after all the mm. ups and downs and the drama and the problems and the wrecks and the bad pit stops and all that, we really, uh, went back and hit the reset button and got everybody back on the same page, I believe. And these guys showed up at Tri-County and just had the kind of day that we've always been capable of having. That is fast in practice, qualify second, get out front. And I don't know the exact amount of laps Bobby led, but probably led, you know, close to 90 of the 99 laps of the race in dominating fashion. Passed the 15 car with about seven laps to go who had pitted earlier than we did and drove off into the sunset and got a dominant victory for Sadler Stanley Racing and pace matic So it's more fun this week, Bill, because we get to talk about our car winning and going to victory lane. And really, uh, you know, we're kind of used to the ups and the downs, but it really is good for things to go right. It, it shows what Bobby can still do. It shows what our team can do, what our cars are capable of doing. So now I'm hopeful that as we turn our attention, as far as the Smart Modified Tour is concerned, we turn our attention to South Boston Speedway this weekend. Certainly hope we can keep that momentum going. Yeah, and and you know if we go back just a little bit, uh, we were pretty down in the mouth, and and we have high expectations for our team. We we've got a great sponsor in Pacematic and other great sponsors. Stanley Law Group is part of that. Uh, we've got Coca Cola units. Um, we've got so many great sponsors, and they have an expectation, especially when you put two legends in our cars like Bobby Labonte and Ryan Newman. And even though Ryan was running this race, he ran in the, as you said, in the Pulaski race where we, where we just had a bad day, but you know, I think, and it's a credit to you, Hermie, um, because I've never been on a three hour zoom, uh, meeting and never said a word. I, I, I sat there and listened to the whole thing. That a record for you. <laughs> that is a new record for me not to say a word. And actually have the mute button on because you, you spoke very from the heart to the team. And, and I think, look, we, we put a lot of confidence and trust in our two drivers. We certainly, you and I have as much confidence as we possibly can in this race team. We didn't build it. You know, we wanted to have fun, but we want to win. We want to be competitive. That's who we are. But you really had a great, I thought, talk with everybody. And we had Ryan, we had Bobby there, and then we had Phil Stefanelli and Neil Cantor. Uh, both of those are crew chiefs for the night, for the 18 and the 39. and. And we had an open and frank discussion because, you know, I don't think anybody believes how we were running this year was acceptable. It's what do we do from here on out that matters. And you were, you were a real team leader. Um, you know, usually Shep's on the show to kiss your ass. I guess I'm in the position now that Shep's gone. But really, I was so impressed with what you said that I, I thought if they asked me what I'm going to say, I, I would say only that I agree totally with Hermie, which I don't like saying. But you really did kind of pump them up and... And it really showed when they unpacked the car. I was not there at Tri County Speedway, but you could see uh, in practice and in qualifying, it was a different attitude for the team. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is, you know, we um, we uh, we needed to make sure that our 
our team that prepares the cars, works on the cars, pits the cars, uh, Phil Stefanelli, PSR Products. You know, they're building a huge business. Their business is growing uh, in some part to the success they've had with Sadler Stanley Racing and the notoriety of our drivers and all that. But it was a, a situation where we wanted PSR Products and, their, and, and our team to know that, you know, we're proud of our relationship and our partnership, but just make sure they know that we expect more and we want more and we're capable of doing more and doing that in a respectful way. And then that was the easy part. The more difficult part for me was having open and honest and frank conversations with drivers and people like Bobby Labonte and Ryan Newman. I've been friends with these guys for over 20 years. I've competed with them. Uh, they both far exceeded what I was able to accomplish uh, behind the wheel, and they're much more accomplished uh, in the seat than I am. And, you know, it's just one of those things. But, you know, you have to treat this race team like a business, whether it's Stadler Brothers Oil Company or whether it's the Stanley Law Group. You know, whatever the case may be, you have to treat everything as a business. And that relates to, you know, accountability. And even though you have drivers like Ryan Newman and Bobby Labonte, they needed to be told and better understand that, okay, we have expectations and marching orders for our drivers too. You have to, you know, you have to do these things the right way and you have to, uh, when you have feedback, it needs to be given in the right way. When we have setbacks, we need our drivers to be, uh, while passionate and show their concern, we need for them to be part of the building back up of the race team and those kind of things. And so when you're dealing with all these personalities, it's just not a, you know, we all have egos. Look, Phil Stefanelli, he's got a, he's got an ego, you know, and, and but he needs to know kind of what our expectations are and we need to do better. Bobby Labonte. I mean, as, as humble of a champion and Hall of Famer as he is, you know, he's got an ego, but he he needed reassurance. I mean, Bobby, you know, was a, he said, and I think you'll agree, he said openly on the phone conversation, looked right at Ryan Newman and said, I'm not as good a driver as Ryan is. And I'm thinking to myself, Bobby, that's just not true. Yeah. You know, you need, you know, we need to put you in the right circumstance so you can prove uh, the type of driver that you are. And, and Ryan is, I mean, He's really carried our race team in a lot of ways so far this year in the races that he's driven because that's one of the things I said to Phil Stefanelli at PSR. I said, don't get fooled by the fact that Ryan Newman has a couple second-place finishes because he didn't have second-place cars in those races. He just got up on the wheel and carried those cars to those finishes. So we still felt like we had a lot of room for improvement in a lot of ways. Uh, but the meeting on Thursday – gave everybody a chance to, you know, air it out. I think you and I both agree that communication is so important in every walk of life, every business, whether you're in court or whether I'm trying to sell fuel to somebody or whether we're talking about the podcast or whether we're talking about Sadler Stanley Racing. You can't keep stuff in. You have to, you know, get it out there on the table and talk about it. Everybody was able to do that, talk about what they like, what they don't like, what was good, what was bad, what the concerns were. And I think Bobby and the team all showed up with a weight off their shoulders even before the first lap of practice because we, they weren't holding things back and, and had things they wanted to say and didn't say them because we said them all on Thursday. We hurt each other's feelings. We were open and honest and frank <laughs> about things. And we put that beside us, and we went on to the racetrack on Saturday night uh, and got uh, two top ten finishes, including a dominating, not just a win, Bill, but a dominating win uh, for Bobby Labonte in the 18 VA uh, Pacematic Open Wheel Modified. Yeah, just like you said, Bobby uh, qualified fourth. They redraw, which is they take the top eight and they kind of they pulled numbers out of a hat. He redrew second, finished first. Cash qualified seventh, starting position after the redraw sixth, then finished ninth. You know, and he was fighting through the crowds a lot. Uh, he got into a little dust up with one of the cars, but. Uh, but fought his way back. And and, and I want to talk about Jonathan Cash, too, because I really want everybody to come out to South Boston this Saturday, Saturday or Sunday, depending on the rain. Uh, we may have, you know, and I want you to talk about that as well. We have so much to talk about the race team. And the race team really is is our baby. It's our fun. But but he led the first lap. Uh, Bobby run, ran the first lap, won it, uh, took the lead, and had the lead at the 30, uh, lap 30 stage break. Uh, so he won the uh, stage one. He kept going, 
Uh, he came back, you know, dropped back into third at one point in time, came back out at lap 23 when he went into the pits, uh, took the lead again, and then just dominated the field. And it was, and in fact, I think here, and I'm reading on what we have here on our recap, he won by a, over 10 car lengths on the final lap, and he was way out in front. It got to the point, and you can watch these uh, Smart Modified Tour races on Flow Racing. It's really, it's very inexpensive platform. You can watch it on your computer, your phone, or, or TV as we do all of that. But it really, Flo started like not following Bobby. They were just looking mid-pack and seeing what else. But there's so much passing at Tri-County and there's so much exciting action. But Bobby was lapping cars, dominating the field, never let up, never let up the gas. And uh, and you could just feel it. And my my family, myself, Chandler, Chandler's friend, Lewis was over spending the night. And my wife, we were watching on the big screen and screaming at the TV, jumping up and down, you know, uh, you know, our fingers crossed, uh, nervous as can be. Uh, but right there in the last uh, stage of laps, it was such a dominating performance by Bobby Labonte, NASCAR Hall of Famer. You could see he was hitting all his marks. He was confident in the turns. He was great in traffic. Um, nobody really had a chance to catch him. Uh, and it was just, you know, he deserved that win. And I can tell you, my family was as excited as we've ever been, even at a race when we've won. Uh, we were hugging each other, crying and 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 tears of joy, uh, because Bobby is just one of our favorites. You know, Chandler loves him to death, and and we just could not believe that what we had been hoping for came true. And and you know, it was between you and Bobby and Ryan and me sitting silently on the phone. I heard a lot of communication, and maybe that's what we were missing. You know, that everybody knew what was happening. So I, it, it was obvious that that there was a symbiotic nature between Bobby and the race team. We even had some of Jonathan uh, Brown's old uh, pit crew there who were all pumped up and excited, but there was that communication and, and it, and it really spoke volumes on the racetrack watching Bobby race around. But then we bring your boy, Jonathan cash. Uh, he's a cart legend, a really soft spoken guy, uh, wears the same black hat, same black shirt. Anytime I've seen him, um, but is a, a, a real student of the game and, uh, and the sport of racing. And man, he was exciting to watch. I mean, what'd you think about that, Herm? I mean, you, you're the one that said when Ryan doesn't run, we made a commitment to Jonathan Cash. I didn't know him from Adam's house cat. You knew better. The guy had never run a modified before this year, right? And here he is out there competing with the best in the Southern modified tour. Yeah, Jonathan Cash owns P&P Speed Shop in Oxford, North Carolina. He's one of my partners, uh, one of my distributors for Premier Racing Chassis, another company that I, that I own. I want to to be involved in karting, to give back to that community, help kids get started in racing because that's how me and my brother started. And Jonathan's a big part of that. He's a, although to your point, not well known, he doesn't have a name like Bobby Labonte or Ryan Newman. When it comes to the mid Atlantic region of Virginia and North Carolina, he's a very accomplished late model stock car racer. Uh, in addition to all the things he's accomplished in the karting industry. And I've seen him race before. I know he can drive. He can, you know, you don't ever have to worry about when you put Jonathan Cash in a car, you know, does he have the grit? Does he have the determination? Does he have the fire? Um, and can he get the job done? Because he's proven time and time again that he can. He's also stepped in uh, as we've worked to make our cars better and make our team better. He stepped up and done some testing uh, for us as well because, you know, uh, Bobby is busy with projects and Ryan is busy with projects sometimes. and. Sometimes we decide to go test. Those guys can't go. Cash jumps in and he gives great feedback, has a great feel for the cars. And so, you know, he still has a lot to do with uh, when our cars are successful. He has a lot to do with the, uh, you know, with the setup of those cars based on the on the feedback that he gives. And, you know, you and I talked a little bit during the week, uh, you know, before Tri-County, we had wrecked cars and we had, you know, un, you know, and one of the things you and I talked about was, Ryan Newman had been running better than Bobby Labonte. And Bobby had said a couple of times, I wonder if Ryan's car is drives different than mine. <laughs> Even though they are built identical, supposed to be identical, identical setups, spring shocks, all that, we took advantage of an opportunity that really became along because of some, in, some tough circumstances. So Bobby has wrecked both of his cars. And heading into Tri-County, I called Phil Stefanelli on Monday afternoon and I said, this is going to sound off the wall to you, but we're going to kill two birds with one stone. We're going to make sure that 
you know, Bobby, we get Bobby's stuff fixed back like it ought to be moving into South Boston and Martinsville and Orange County coming up. But take Ryan Newman's car that has been outrunning Bobby, take the 39 off of it and put 18 on it. We're going to let Bobby drive Ryan's car to see if we can answer some of those questions. And then we took another car, our fourth car, and fit it up and put uh, put Jonathan Cash in that. And so really, and Bobby mentioned this after the race, if you saw the Victory Lane interview, he said, well, this is Ryan's car, and uh, he's not getting it back. <laughs> right. So, right. And it sounds like he's not getting it back. And uh, yeah. you got to leave and him in I the called, same car. I called, Phil, I called Phil this past Monday after Tri-County, and I said, you know, Bobby seats in that car. He won a race in that car. You know, Bobby, because he runs all the races in the smart tool for that series, he is our priority. He is he is the guy that uh, if we, you know, we try to give both of our drivers the best opportunity, the best equipment, the best engines, the best support. Pacematic enables us to do that with their sponsorship. But I said, you know, Ryan's running a partial schedule, even though we do have the 39, um, you know, competing for a owner's championship. You know, Bobby's showing up every week. And so he's our he's our guy. And so when we have to make a decision on, you know, equipment and cars and whatever, we're going to we're going to, um, you know, lean towards Bobby if when and if we have to do that, because he's he's our full time guy running all the races. So uh, it paid off. It worked out great. Bobby got the job done. Bobby now has a lot of confidence. The team has a lot of confidence. And I hope and expect that they'll carry that momentum right into South Boston this weekend. Well, and and that's exactly right. We got Sobo coming up. One thing I, you know, we've got two races left. It's uh, South Boston and then Orange County two weeks after that. And the Smart Series. And that's the championship for the Smart Series. Then we have one race where we're entering uh, for the last race in the Whelan Modified. That's the NASCAR sponsored uh, Modified Series at Martinsville, which is what, October 26th, I think it is, Thursday. Uh, yeah, so it's going to be a quick turnaround. We, we're trying, we, I tell you, the guys, in the shop are thrashing because we've got South Boston coming up. And then, you know, when we get down to the 26th and 28th, we got South Boston, then a week off. And then we got Martinsville on Thursday, turn right around in Orange County on Saturday for the smart tour championship. And so that's you know, really something that we've got to get really up prepared for because we have no idea what may happen at Martinsville on Thursday, you know, and got to be ready for Orange County. Uh, on Saturday, so uh, we uh, we're working hard to get our fleet of cars and engines back in uh, the kind of shape that we'll need for them to be to get the job done uh, down the stretch here for our final three races. You know, and uh, right now, in terms of our standing, in uh, Bobby as a driver is ninth in points. Um, you know, because we've had some tough races there. He's even after the win. Yeah, the weekend, he's uh, really? he's in ninth. He's stuck in ninth because some of the some of the higher uh, number drivers uh, kind of made it through and didn't do so poorly. But, uh, and when it comes to car owner points, Sadler Stanley racing is in ninth place, just like Bobby is with the 18, but believe it or not, Hermie, we're in third place with the 39 driven by Jonathan cash in four races and, 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 uh, Brian Newman driving the rest. So we are kind of within striking distance. If the 39 does well this weekend on the owner side, then. Mm -hmm. so on the owner yeah. side, we're still competing and, and look, I want Bobby to get at least a top 10. I want them to win this week as well. I think that might shoot them in there. We may not make it. I guess what they do is what the top three go into the final race for the championship. The top three drivers and top three owners have chances to win the championship. So you could see, you know, especially with the strength of our 39, you could see one person win a driver's championship and then another team win the owner's championship out of the small three at Orange County on the, on the 28th. So that's what we were going to be trying to do is pull that party. Yeah, and if you if you look right now at the standings, uh, in the drivers, um, let's see the drivers points. Bert Myers number four, he's in first in the drivers um, point system, first in the owners point system. Brandon Ward second, Carson Lofton third, Joey Coulter fourth, Caleb Hetty with the seven NY is fifth, Brian Lofton sixth, Tim Brown seventh, and then Bobby Labonte. I'm sorry, he's in eighth, so he's in eighth place. Gershner ninth. Uh, they called Gershner, Jeremy Gershner, the Florida flyer. And I think he's the Sarasota spinner after last week. <laughs> he just knows how to spin that car too much. And then Jason Myers rounds up the top 10 
in terms of owner points. Burt Myers, number one. Randy Renfro, that's the number two car, second. And then you and me in the 39, we're 62 points back. If we have a good showing with the 39 this weekend, uh, I think we've uh, got a good shot at, at getting into the final and, and trying to win the title in the 39 in the Orange County race, which is going to be exciting. Orange County is a great track, and South Boston is too. I mean, what what are you thinking right now? We've we've got some options here that you told me about last night on the phone. We've got some options here at, at South Boston. Let's discuss those for Sadler well, Stanley Racing. Right. First, before we get to that, you mentioned your friend, Burt Myers. Yeah. No friend of mine. But <laughs> did you tell Burt Myers that I am responsible for him to be able <laughs> to continue to drive his haul or two and from the track this weekend? As a matter of fact, I did last night in a phone call. I had a good conversation with him for about 45 minutes. Talked racing, talked race oh, so That's why you didn't call me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a little busy with my other buddy, Burt. Uh, so I had the honor of representing Bert in a speeding case. He got a speeding ticket, or you know, over 80 miles an hour speeding ticket, trying to get to the South Boston race in the spring. And we went to trial. And funny enough, you know, if you remember and if you listened to last week's episode, uh, we were in Emporia uh, for uh, a court case, a, a guy that I represented in Hermie New. And I said, Hermie, come with me and we'll sit there and and we described what was uh, Darwin's waiting room. It was a different place for those people charged with crimes that morning. But we were sitting around waiting, and all of a sudden, everybody and their mother sees Hermie. And they're like, hey, what's going on? Hey, 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 Hermie. What, what are you doing? What are you waiting here? Oh, and I get moved to the front of the line because of Hermie Sadler. Thing goes well because of Hermie Sadler. I walk into the Brunswick Courthouse, which I've not been to in, God, 10 years. You know, So I don't really know the process. And I walk in there, and I sit down. I find out where the, who the, who the officer was that pulled Burt Myers over. And it turns out his name is Captain Jones. Captain, you know, his first name, Dwayne Jones. Dwayne Jones. Yep. Yep. And I sit down with him and I say, Hey, uh, you know, I got this case, uh, Burt Myers, you know, a race car driver. And he looks at me and I'm like, Bowman Gray. I'm like, no, no, not really registering, uh, related to chocolate Myers, uh, the gas can man for, uh, for, uh, Big E, Dale Earnhardt. Yeah. Okay. And he's like, yeah, but, Hermie Sadler, <laughs> he says, he says, I know Hermie and Elliot. Just saw Elliot a little while ago and I race and he races on dirt, like these mini kind of stock cars. He races go-kart. Yeah. The mini cup cars. Yeah. At Brunswick Speedway. Pretty yeah. cool stuff. So he so, starts showing me the stuff on his and phone. I coached his daughter. His daughter, Kayla, played on the girls basketball team at Brunswick Academy. And I coached her for several years of basketball. Sweet, sweet kid. And so I, we've known the Joneses uh, forever and ever. So, so we have a great conversation about guess who? Hermie Sadler in our race team and, and all the things we're doing and, and nice as uh, uh, and could be. And I mean, our, our sheriffs throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia are fine people and really not paid enough. I always put in a raise for him in the state Senate, try to get him more money. But here was a guy that was just passionate about racing. And we sat there and talked a little bit. And I said, you know, I don't have the guy's record. And he goes, oh, I'll go get it. And he gets the clerk to print it out for him. And Bert had a very clean record. Some not, not even a blemish since, you know, 93. And, um, he looks at me and he says, well, cause of Hermie, <laughs> how about a non-moving violation? And you know, this kind of fine, a very low fine. I was like, sure. And here I was in my mind again, going once again, I went to law school. I have done prominent high profile cases. I win a lot of stuff and it's like, I have the badge of honor by hanging out with the dude and calling him my bestie who owns a gas station. Cause he gets things done better in court than I do. So Congratulations to you, Hermie Sadler, and your good name. But it you worked for Bert Myers. And I told Bert, I said, you need to thank, you know, he was thanking me. And I said, no, you need to thank Hermie Sadler. Because I said, well, you know, yeah. And, and the guy runs in the uh, smart series with us. And he's like, oh, okay, okay. Well, and went back to talking about Elliot and Hermie and, uh, and his relationship and has the highest respect for you as, as I told him. And he knew that you guys had for, for Captain Jones. And he, and I, and actually I think, in South Boston this week, and he's running for a champion uh, championship at the Brunswick Brunswick, Brunswick Speedway. Yep. Brunswick Speedway, oh, that's a dirt track. Dirt track. And so he, I invited him to come and see us race, and he said, "I got a championship to run." And you know, it's amazing to me. I said, well, "What's the what's the prize money?" He said, three thousand dollars." I mean, these guys are out there doing it because they love it. They're in people's cars. They work on them. They're not making a you know a big living out of it. They're not becoming millionaires, and and it's not like what you see in NASCAR and even that NASCAR costs have come down. 
but it takes a lot of money to put these teams together, as you know and I know. And uh, and we've been very fortunate to have Pacematic as our sponsor. But here's a guy protecting Brunswick County, putting his life on the line every day. A nice, fair, just uh, sheriff, and he's going out to the to the dirt track, running for a championship. Yeah, I thought that been, was an I awesome he's story. Been a long time too. Yeah. And, and what an awesome story, and what an awesome guy. So I want to thank him. It was nice to meet him, and I hope I see him again. Uh, but it seems like I have the Hermy passport when it comes to Greensville and Poyer and Brunswick. Now I got to go back to Brunswick here in a little while. I'm going to be name dropping you like a son of a gun because it's a t- it's a tougher case. <laughs> but but uh, I thought that was really cool. And you know, and and going back to Pacematic just for a second, you and I were on a text uh, string with them. It was amazing, you know, and it's great to see your sponsor. You know, they get it. They love winning. They see their their you know, their logo on the back of our cars and on the side of our cars and on the race series itself, they sponsor. I mean, they do such a great thing, but, but it felt so good with them texting back and forth with old Alan Joseph and, uh, Michael Pace, how excited they were that we won, uh, right there at Tri-County. And that was an amazing thing to do. I was, I was so excited after that race, man. I mean, I was, I called you, I think I talked to Phil Stefanelli. I talked to Chris Williams. I talked to, to Bobby. It was, it was a great night, man. It was one of a kind and wish I was there to see it, but I uh, was happy that I was with my family who loves racing uh, to see what a comeback, what a win, what a dominating performance. And to get back to your point, so we got two races to go in the Smart Series. This weekend at South Boston, as we're taping, it's Tuesday afternoon. Uh, there is rain in the forecast at South Boston on Saturday. There has not been a decision made as of today right now as to whether or not the race can or will come off on Saturday at the advertised date and time or potentially Sunday. So we mentioned earlier about Jonathan Cash, you know, filling in for Ryan Newman. So the 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 fact of the matter is for this weekend on Saturday, Ryan Newman is not available. So if we race on Saturday, we'll have Bobby Labonte in the 18, Jonathan John, Jonathan Cash in the 39, which if you remember Jonathan Cash probably had the best car to last 30, 40 laps in the first race at South Boston. If he could have he gotten did. by your friend, Burt Myers, without him blocking <laughs> uh, like a you-know-what, uh, Jonathan had a great chance to win that race. Um, so I'm confident with either one of them going. However, if the race gets moved to Sunday, then Ryan Newman is available. And if that happens, we'll actually, Saddler Stanley Racing, will have three cars on the track. We'll have Bobby Labonte. And we'll have uh, Ryan Newman in the 39, and then we'll have uh, Jonathan Cash in the 17, uh, in a third car. So I know that's what you've been yarning for all year. My dream come uh, true. It's, it's multiple <laughs> cars on the racetrack, regardless of the consequences. Um, so <laughs> regardless it, it, of it, the if consequences. We, if we race on Sunday, um, we'll have three cars out there. So we'll wait and see what Mother Nature does and what uh, Smart Modified Tour decides, and we'll adjust accordingly. Well, I'm not going to say that I'm praying for rain, but I have been trying to talk you into a third car, maybe even a fourth car sometimes. And I have, maybe if you've been listening to this podcast, as so many Every thousands of you Every time you say you that, have. you tell me you'll write a check out of your personal account to cover it. <laughs> I don't and, know that I said that. Uh, I don't remember that part. I, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I haven't. I don't remember that part, but, but we have offered the ride, uh, and we, I mean me, to a lot of people, including, but not limited to, Kenny Wallace. Kyle Petty, I'd love to see them in the car. Although uh, Kenny didn't do too well in the cars tour this weekend, did he? What I want to see right now is I want to see our cars win and not getting torn up for a while. Yeah, that'd be great. No, that, that's a great idea too. But three cars, I mean, we'd be like 10% of the field. Over 10% of the field would be Sadler Stanley Racing, Pacematic Power, kind of Beautiful thing is Orange. What put my dad, you know, people ask me all the time, so I'll just get this out there. How'd y'all get in racing? Talking about me and Elliot. My dad, owned race cars that raced on dirt tracks, you know, in the late sixties, early seventies, mid seventies, uh, but never drove. But what put him out of racing, my dad will tell you right now, the the day he got out of racing is the day that his partner, Julian Mitchell, from right here in Emporia, used to own Mitchell Brothers Supermarket. Julian and my dad were best friends. They owned this race team together. They had a 100-lap dirt race at Saluda all these years ago. And and I don't remember the exact payout, but it, 
it was a big, big dirt race for, you know, the late 1970s. And so Julian Mitchell, who uh, is wide open with everything, said, Herman, let's take two cars to Saluda so we can finish first and second and really wax their ass. So we we had Eddie Royster driving one car, well known dirt racer from Middleburg, North Carolina area, and James Hilton, who made his name in the Alka series later in life and actually ran some cup races uh, later. We had Eddie Royster and James Hilton driving my dad's and Julian Mitchell's two beautifully prepared number twenty two cars. They had Weekend Warrior on the side of them. That's what kind of what they called themselves. <laughs> so, plan is going great. They qualify first and second. The green flag drops. They're running first and second. The first caution comes out when Eddie Royster, who's running second in one of my dad's cars, spins out, but doesn't hit anything. But the caution comes out. James Hilton, the other driver, went all the way around the track while the caution was out and dust was flying. He couldn't see him and ran into the other car that my dad owned. Total lost both cars running into each other. And so my dad walked right over to Julian Mitchell that day and said, he called him Junior Buck. He said, Junior Buck, I'm out. It's all yours. (laughs) And Julian's like, Herman, you going to give me all this equipment? You know, I ain't gonna, you're not going to make me pay for my half? He said, I'm going to do you a favor. You got, you can have it all. And Junior Buck was like, thank you so much, Herman. Da, da, da. Of course, about six months later, Junior Buck comes to daddy. You son of a <laughs> gave me all this. So he gave him a black hole of, uh, of race cars and equipment that <laughs> Junior Buck was now individually responsible for funding um, in good days and bad. So uh, uh, this this thing that you constantly push for is what put my dad out of race. I take it back. I take it all this back. I ta- we don't. We this only have to put on. one on. How's that? One car. I mean, well, we got two already. You didn't tell me that story ahead of time. I mean, I, I enjoy. I mean, how how often does your lieutenant governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Winsome Sears, get offered to run in an open wheel modified? As one of our drivers. I mean, that's. I thought that would have been a great idea because she showed up campaigning for Emily Brewer. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, t- I take that one back so too. I, unfortunately, uh, I struck her off the list to drive. Still a great lieutenant governor. Yeah, absolutely uh, great person. Uh, great person. Can I drive the car now? The Commonwealth of Virginia. Can't drive the car now. No. Yeah, I'm not going to pay for her <laughs> to drive my race car when, you know, I'm a loyal person. I demand loyalty. I give loyalty, like it or don't. And I think you're a, a lot of the same way. Always. I I give unconditionally and I'm loyal and I just expect it back. Yep. So if I don't get that, you know, I'm sorry. I don't I don't roll like that. So what do you think we're gonna do? I mean, we've got sponsorship. We're very grateful. Pacematics signed on for another year. We're we're we have a great relationship with them. They're really into what we're doing here. And the reason one of the reasons we got this the short track open wheel modified team was to help short tracks in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina survive and thrive, help those small businesses that surround uh, those short tracks and depend on them partly for their income. And, and then the, the skill games that are in those, uh, in those convenience stores around those short tracks and in the, in the rural areas that use that money that they, that they get from having skill games of bona fide, legitimate skill games in their stores, restaurants, bars, convenience stores, truck stops, um, in order to survive in this Biden economy, the Bidenomics, um, it's really a good symbiotic thing. So where do we go from here? I know it's one race and, and you know me, uh, Hermie, if, if, if you haven't, you know, you have been listening to us, if you're here for the first time, we want to thank you for coming. It's a growing, uh, audience and we really appreciate it. But Hermie, if we're not having a good time, uh, I always want to be like the barking dog, all the, what, what happened? What went wrong? What do we do? What do we do? And Hermie needs a 24 hour period. Now, you know, we have one win under our belt in the 2023 racing season. And I'm like, where do we go from here, bud? I mean, what do you see, you know, looking forward with Sadler Stanley racing? What are we looking forward to in ending this year and then going into next year? Well, 
You and I And don't are... start with that story from your dad again. <laughs> you you That's can have it. <laughs> How about That's that? A story. That's a true story. <laughs> oh, good um, Lord, it's hilarious. True story. Um, you know, but as we continue to fight in court, you mentioned the, the skill game lawsuit. The Commonwealth of Virginia is still after us. And one of the things that, you know, as we're sitting here talking, we're waiting for a decision to come down from the Supreme Court of Virginia that could affect our case in one way or the other. So, you know, the uh, the uh, attorney general and the governor's office and otherwise there, you know, they have yet to be willing to come sit down to the table and try to work this out. Um, and I say that because one of the reasons why we have this race team and why the race team is working is there are a lot more people, as I'm talking to you right now, a lot more people know who and what Pacematic is now than two years ago. Because right. all two years ago, the skew game industry was just gray machines and bad people yeah. and dirty people and sneaky people and you know, what we've tried to, to do partly with the race team is, hey, you can try to label these people if you want to, just because you don't like them. But these are good, hardworking, honest people that have built a tremendous business that provide wonderful opportunities for their employees and small businesses that legally operate these games. So we've carried the, the, the banner of, you know, it's not all, it's not scuzzy. Not gray machines. Right. They're not killing the lottery. Not run by Alibaba's, like they say. Not, that crap. None of that. The, this is a viable business, uh, and these people have names, and they are providing opportunities. They're supporting small businesses. They support the Constitution. All these things. So one of the things we've done is simply by carrying the Pacematic brand and logo on these cars around these the smart modified tour is we're educating and letting more people know about people like Pacematic. Okay, a lot of people see these big casinos when they go up and they see Rosies when they get built. Not, not, not a lot of people know what the casino people and the Rosies people are trying to do behind the scenes. They try to hide that in the middle of the night in the dark. And so we're trying to let people know, look, on the other side of this fight, these are the people that we're representing. These are the people that we want you to know more about. We want you to know more about how they're supporting small businesses and how they help small businesses, especially coming off of a pandemic, not only keep their businesses open, but pay their employees and invest in their properties, infrastructure, and all that. So going around to these racetracks has just really helped. A lot more people are aware and are educated on what Pacematic is, and I think that's a big part of the Especially, it's not going to make any difference necessarily in the court of law, but in the court of public opinion, I think our race team is a big part of introducing Pacematic and that industry to people in the public so people know that, you know, we're the white hat. We're, you know, the other, the other side spends a lot of money trying to put the black hat on what we're trying to do. Right. But the fact of the matter is we're fighting for all the things that are right. That is families, small businesses, the Constitution, level playing field, all these things. And I think a, a big byproduct of our race team has been how we've uh, educated and let more people know what Pacematic is. And the other thing, too, is Pacematic, through their sponsorship of the Smart Modified Tour, these races, you know, at the end of this year, started last year, end of this year. These races have a much bigger feel to them now than they did three years ago before Pacematic came along. It was still a good tour and it was growing, but it's like when Pacematic came on board, it like it like threw the fire. It yeah. threw threw gas on the fire yep. to really start to promote the, the the smart tour people could promote these races, pay the kind of purses that are now bringing in 26, 27, 28 race winning cars. You know, a couple of years ago, let's be honest, it was 15 cars and only three of them could win. Mm -hmm. Now, with this kind of purse money and this infrastructure and this, you know, uh, this uh, exposure for sponsors, and, you know, we're able to, it just feels like when you take a, like this weekend to South Boston, when these modifieds roll in, 
it's a bigger deal now than it was a couple of years ago. And a lot of it has to do with the, you know, with the money and the, and the power that, uh, that pace has is, is done. So, yeah. you know, that's the part that we see every day, but I do think a big, a big byproduct of what we're doing with the tour and with our cars is humanizing pace and who they are, what they do, um, and all these other things. And I think it's very, very, uh, important that we do that. Well, and I think, you know, not only you're exactly right on that part, but, but their involvement and willingness to engage in those rural areas, in those inner cities, in the areas where the convenience stores, the truck stops, the bars, the restaurants have the games, they're involved in the community where if you look at the casinos, in my opinion, from where, where I'm looking at them, uh, they have their bricks and mortar. Well, most of them are tents right now or old buildings. They haven't built the new casinos yet. They're taking in the monies, but there's not that engagement with the community. I mean, if you look at what pace does, they come down, they donate to so many good causes, local causes, wherever they are in those communities to help young men and women thrive, get a job, get job training. Uh, they're so committed to things like that. That's what they think about. You know, that you, you recall, uh, when they found out that, um, uh, my bill for the uh, for the robotics team got killed for political reasons because of you, uh, and one of the places was in your area was willing, you know, needed that kind of scholarship money that would be able to pay for the robotics team to be able to build the robot and also travel to these uh, statewide and na- nationwide competitions. They immediately stepped up and said, "Hey, we want to help," and that just speaks volumes on who they are. And with this, you know, with this race team. They, they saw what our vision was. We didn't ask, they said, can we come along? And we, we gladly said, sure, let's, let's make this journey together. If you look at even the, and like you said, in the smart series itself in the growth, you know, they've made a commitment to something like that. They understand it's important for the people who play their games, who love also auto racing. And especially at the local tracks that are so important to, to survive the need for them to survive. And so they've, they've gone all in on that and they're getting ready to expand more of that involvement with the smart series. They, they've been a committed partner and now they're talking about other great things they can do, like creating a junior series underneath the smart tour that runs with the smart tour with what they call crate modifieds, which are a little less horsepower that younger people run in that could run as a feature race before the smart series. They want to do things like that. They want to give young drivers opportunities to, uh, to compete at that level so that they can grow into you know, competitors at the smart series level or at the wheel and modified level and give those opportunities to families and to people that want to build cars and, and fulfill dreams. I mean, that's that kind of commitment that we're seeing. I see great things for the smart series as it grows. I see some uh, opportunities for partnerships with other racetracks. I see great opportunities for partnerships with other, um, with other race leagues, like, you know, the cars tour owned by, uh, you know, Dale Earnhardt Jr. And, and, uh, and Kevin Harvick. I, I think you're going to see some growth there that could only have come from pace involvement and willingness and understanding how important that is to the, to the traditional sports, the local sports, the grassroots racing in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. And that makes me excited that they want to come on board and they wanted to be a part of this. You don't see that with the casinos. You don't see anything like that. They take their money. They take the money from the people that least can afford it. And they take it out of the state. pace brings the money in, allows the local businesses like you know, like your small business and other small businesses throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia to compete in the gaming market, to be a player in the gaming market, to have their little space without interfering with the big casinos. And yet they stay and they stay with the, they stay with the, the convenience store. And I know a lot of those that have come to talk in you with you and me love the relationship that they have with pace and and, and everybody can say, well, Stanley, you're just shilling for them because you know, you represent them. They're your sponsors. No, it's it's a lot more. There's a human factor about that company, with Michael Pace, with Carmen Pace, with you know Alan Joseph, uh, Paul Goldine. It goes on and on. Barley. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Gina, uh, both Genas, and you know, you know them. You get to know them. It's not some uh, stuffy corporate types. It's not that casino ilk. It is. It is real human beings that really do give a crap about that small business owner and being and that small business owner being successful. And, and I got to hand it to them and, and their willingness to be a part of this racing experience. This journey that we're on has really been uh, something that has been meaningful, impactful, and successful. So far, so good, but it's, uh, we, we're building something and people that come talk to me has gone a lot from what is pace to now, you know, we appreciate pace and what they do. Yeah. And so, uh, building that kind of that brand loyalty amongst the people 
here in the Commonwealth of Virginia and North Carolina, South Carolina, other places uh, that we run. And so I hope now through this process and other things that are going on, people will be more inclined to be to listen and be open minded when there there is a discussion going on about pacematic and the fight for fuel gains and what the casinos and the casinos act one way when they want to get in the paper and they got a lot of other things going on um, in the middle of the night that they don't want anybody to know and I'm feeling the effects of that right here locally in my hometown. Yeah, how's that roses going? Continue to fight for continue to fight for what's right. Hi folks, this is Hermie Sadler. Thanks for listening to our all new podcast, Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. I hope you are enjoying the show as much as Senator Stanley and I enjoy bringing it to you. Whether you're a family traveling together or a truck driver hauling freight up and down the highway, I hope you will take the time to visit one of our Sadler Travel Plaza locations in Virginia and North Carolina. Sadler Travel Plaza locations are licensed dealer locations for pilot travel centers. And we also carry Shell Motiva Petroleum products for our four-wheel friends. We pride ourselves on providing one-stop shopping for service, food, and entertainment. Our food options include Five Guys Burgers and Fries, Quiznos, Dairy Queen, Hermie Sadler's Faux Show Bar and Grill, Victory Lane Restaurant, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Dunkin' Donuts, and much, much more. Our locations include Sadler Travel Plaza in South Hill, located off I-85 at Exit 12. The Sadler Travel Plaza of Emporia, which is conveniently located on exit 11B off I-95 and Sadler Travel Plaza on Highway 58 in Suffolk. We also have our North Carolina location, Sadler Travel Plaza in Dunn, North Carolina. That's exit 75 off I-95. We appreciate all of our customers. And Bill and I appreciate you listening to Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pacematic. Hey, this is Bill Stanley, Hermie Sadler's sidekick on this podcast. When I'm not in Richmond at the Capitol or doing this podcast, my real job for the past 27 years is as a trial attorney with the Stanley Law Group. Here at the Stanley Law Group, we represent our clients in every courthouse in the Commonwealth. No problem is too small for us to solve. No case is too big for us to win. Whether it's criminal charges, traffic offenses, civil disputes, litigation matters of any sort, we handle it all. We make sure that we treat every client like family because they are to us. Your problem is our problem. Your success is our success because we hate to lose more than we love to win. And believe me, we win a lot. Don't believe me? Go ask Hermie. I'm his favorite lawyer, and he hates lawyers. So give us a call at 540-721-6028 and let us help you. Or visit our website at www.vastanleylawgroup.com. That's www.vastanleylawgroup.com. At the Stanley Law Group, we'll make sure we're the lawyers that you swear by and not at. Uh, let me just jump back one second on brand loyalty. I had a guy come up to me, and of course he knew that I was friends with you. Everybody, you know, my whole connection to life now is that I'm that I'm friends with you, Herm. And he said, you know, and I guess were you, you were sponsored by Dewalt Tools at one time. Yeah, right. I had Virginia's for lovers. My first couple of years, then Dewalt. Yeah. Okay. Well, this guy was saying how. Um, he loved you as a race car driver and the only tools he bought was DeWalt because they sponsored your car. That kind of brand loyalty really yeah. speaks volumes for the people that watch these races. And that's, what's really translating. I think well for pace and queen of Virginia skill, uh, all of those things. So I, I think that's, that's just an, another, you know, example of why small grassroots racing, smaller grassroots racing below the NASCAR level can be so impactful for many companies. And I would urge anybody out there who owns a small business to go out there and find a race car driver, maybe in your area, sponsor them, buy some tires, get your stickers on the side of the car, go out and have the racing experience with them, share in that, their enjoyment of the racing experience and also the thrill of winning and, and the challenges that come along with it. I mean, you know, these kind of series and these drivers, this is all homegrown. Uh, we're the exception, not the rule in terms of us putting this race team together. We're still homegrown, but not to the guys that are working every day and at night working on the car in the garage take it up there to the short track like in South Boston this weekend on October 17th, that's Saturday or Sunday for an exciting race there. And they race their hearts out, man. Any small business out there should, should locate one of these teams and try to reach out and help them. But, uh, I was asking you about Rosie's, you know, when we were recording last time, you showed me a picture of uh, people lined out the door on a weekday 
uh, waiting for the doors of Rosie's to open. What have you seen in terms of its uh, its impact, what it's doing around there in Emporia? Well, I haven't been in there, um, not going in there. <laughs> I didn't think you um, would. <laughs> until, you know, if the day comes where they come sit down at the table with you and I and other people that are, all we're asking for is a level playing field and equal fair government that will rule and run all businesses and all of those that are legally uh, allowed to participate uh, in that industry. Once they realize that, you know, uh, procuring a monopoly for them is not what the United States of America is all about, certainly not the Commonwealth of Virginia is about, if they ever came and sat down at a table and we figured out how we could all coexist and do business in the, in the same town, like we, like all other small businesses do here in Emporia and Greensville County outside of Rosie's, then I'll support them. But until then, I'm not, but they, I mean, they have lots of calls, people pulling in and out. I don't know anything other than I have had people tell me that have gone is, you know, through this point, they've been open about three weeks now, whatever. Uh, when you go in now, when you register and sign up, they give you free money to play with, um, you know, your first time there, they give you, they give you free plays so you can, um, I guess so they can get you hooked, then you can, yeah, then that's a hook. Back, you know, but they, they are giving people, uh, free plays and money when they go in and things of that nature to get them started. But, you know, I just, you know, I, I love competition, not only in racing, but in life and in business. And one of these days, the casino industry, maybe those people with Rosie's will understand they need all the other small businesses and the people that I employ and their families to do well also, just like Rosie's does, because they need some of the people that work for me and their families to go support Rosie, just like I need people that work at Rosie's to come support me. But they're not really sending the right message with that, as far as I'm concerned, by basically having the same mindset they've had since they started their entry into Virginia and what me and you are fighting against is <clears throat> we deserve a monopoly and we won't stop fighting until we get a monopoly. And we're not really worried about the negative impacts they, that may have on other small businesses in Virginia. That's not the kind of friendly neighbor that uh, they want the, to portray themselves to be while at the same time fighting for that monopoly that they're working so hard to get. Yeah. And I, I was talking to one of your employees last time I was at your place and They'd offered her a job uh, more than twice. And uh, the ironic thing is, is I thought they served food in Rosie's, but uh, your employees t- seem to think that they come in and sit down and eat your food at Faux Show. So what's that say to you? Well, they have their meetings at Faux Show, and then they do try to proposition our people on the way out about coming to work over there. I still think they're short, uh, short staff, but like a lot of people in the area, short staff. But um, they got to do what they think is right. We got to do what we think is right. And uh, we're going to keep fighting and see where we land. Well, you're still not losing any of your employees, which says a lot about your business that you run. But, you know, again, I guess the point I would make about that, especially thinking about this now, is that remember when the referendum was put on the ballot and people voted for it. All the, you know, local politicos were saying, this is going to bring jobs to our area. But what it seems to be doing is not bringing jobs to our area. It's just helping facilitate the transfer of someone having a job at one place locally and over that's there. Right. And that's not that's net right. growth of jobs. That makes the, uh, the job pool a little thinner and hurts the small businesses that have been there paying the taxes in Emporia and Greensville County for years and years and years and employing the people there and giving them good wages and keeping them out of poverty and providing them health insurance. That seems to be the middle finger in my mind sometimes to, to guys like you and other businesses in that area uh, that they'd say this is going to bring jobs in, but what it really does is hurt your business in terms of being able to f- fully staff it with good people and watching good people that you've trained and that you've been loyal to going across the street because lo- loyalty is nothing to Rosie's. They're hiring them for, you know, a dollar to five dollars more an hour, whatever they can do to try to take them away from you. Well, the government is not supposed to be picking winners and losers. How many times have we said that they shouldn't be giving Rosie's a captive audience? That's what they're doing. Um, and to your point, I'm, I went and spoke at City Council of Emporia, you know, before Rosie's built. And I said, they can say they're going to create 100 jobs, but they're just going to relocate 75 or 80 of that 100. It's just not that many, not many people here. Um, and but anyway, like I said, 
Uh, we're focusing on what I can control, and they got to do what they got to do. And uh, but we're going to continue fighting for. We said it a thousand times: a level <laughs> playing field. That's all anybody can want. Yeah, for the little guy. And what's wrong with that? I mean, that's that's, that's really what this country's founded on: the principles of fight for the little guy, for redemption, for for freedom. Have a level playing field. Have the same rules of the game for all local businesses. Let people decide where they want to go spend their money without being told by the government and let competition take over the free market system, take over. <clears throat> and it always seems to work itself out. Yeah. And before we start leaning right, because we've been turning left talking about racing and now we're talking about gambling and, and certainly we are waiting for everybody who's been following us. We have a lot of convenience store owners that listen to this podcast, wanting to know what's going on with our lawsuit. We have the injunction in place. They have appealed for the second time that that is still pending before the Virginia Supreme court. Uh, the amicus briefs, which are friends of the court's briefs, have been filed um, by the Churchill Downs, the owner of Rosie's, and the casinos, trying to say that skill games should not be a part of the gaming industry and that small businesses should not be allowed to uh, to uh, thrive and, and be a part of that gaming industry, the emerging gaming industry in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Something I was against from, against from the very beginning, but, but believe that if you're going to let it happen, you ought to let Virginians participate in that marketplace. It's only fair. And they've been doing everything they can to shut us down, keeping tax dollars away from the Commonwealth of Virginia because they'd rather uh, Virginia not get it in order to put pressure on Virginia to allow them to dictate the policy and monopolize how gaming in Virginia will occur, which I think is patently unfair. And here we go again through the, you know, the hamster wheel. But we have trial coming up in December. In fact, you've got your deposition coming up this week, my man. I mean, yep. you are going, even though that you were on the stand, if I remember correctly, about an hour and a half, two hours in the first um, go round when we got the injunction, when the skill games were turned back on because they are protected free speech interaction with the player and the game itself uh, uh, based on Supreme court of the United States principles. Uh, they had every opportunity to cross examine you. I'm going to tell you, you were one of the best uh, clients uh, that I've ever had testify. I thought we were very effective in, in getting that message out and the facts that you testified to, but now the attorney general wants to depose you after having cross-examined you. Um, you've never had a deposition taken of yourself. I know you've sat in, uh, in a couple with me and like with yeah. Kevin Hall, the former uh, uh, lottery guy that by the end of it, he was kind of waving his umbrella at me, coming at me. I don't think he enjoyed my questions, but uh, now's your turn to be deposed. You, have you ever taken a deposition before? Never. Okay. Well, guess what? Here it comes. But, you know, let's see what they, they want to ask. And, and, and if I had to think, you know, if I was prepping you right now, because what the hell we're talking, you know, I have to think they're going to try to say that you're greedy, right? That what you're doing is all about greed. Uh, I don't know, that uh, you're taking money away from lottery and, and the casinos. I mean, what else do you think they'd, they'd come at you with? I have no idea. I don't know. I'm, you know like I said, I did. Uh, I testified. I got cross-examined. And. You know, everything that they've tried to say, we've been able to disprove uh, in a court of law. And they can say all the things they want to about money. But I said it before, I'll say it here, and I'll say it in the deposition. If they think that's what it is, they can take all the skill games in the Commonwealth of Virginia and throw them in the Atlantic Ocean. As long as they take the casinos with them, they are the ones, the Commonwealth of Virginia are the ones that decided they were going to open the floodgates to gaming in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And these casinos and Rosies and these otherwise, they were going to be the golden ticket that's going to you know, fix all the economic problems we all have in uh, different parts of Virginia, especially, especially the rural areas like I live in. But then they've decided to, to let these casinos come in and basically run the industry, create their own laws, and at the same time, you know, step on the constitutional rights of small businesses. So I don't care if we don't have games, but if, if the casinos can build and do their business and Rosie's can come and build and do their business, then the small businesses should be able to legally and constitutionally run the games that they're legally operated to be able to run and run their businesses and take care of their families, just like the casinos, casino people uh, do. And that's just not what is happening. So yeah. I understand they probably have to make this about money to try to win a point in the point in the court of public opinion. But to me, it's not even about that. It's about 
Alkin now. I'm the a third generation owner operator of a small business in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I'm now responsible for the daily operations of this company, our convenience stores, the oil company, the truck stop, my 300 plus employees, and everything else. I'm responsible, but it's okay for the government to give a monopoly or to give a better deal to the casinos and then basically have the governor, Ralph Northam, sign a law that says, okay, we're going to come in and take this part of y'all's revenue in this piece of y'all's business and give it to the casinos. They don't have to earn it. We're just going to give it to them. And then I get told things like I heard Janet Howell, Senator Howell, say on the Senate floor one day when she was actually in a committee meeting when this discussion was going on about skill games. Actually, someone else, I think Jennifer McClellan, actually stood up and made a few comments warning. Janet Howell about the risks of the government picking winners and losers and and giving all this power to the casinos and all this revenue and money and all the damage being done to small businesses and Senator Howell not very compassionately said well those people are just going to have to find another way to make money yeah it's crazy it's crazy I mean all this is about is fundamental fairness and if you know what is the casino and by the way why are you afraid way, of small businesses like this? And by the way, before we filed a lawsuit, and you know this, but maybe the general public doesn't, and maybe the attorney general's office that's going to depose me this week doesn't know it. Before we filed a lawsuit, I spent two years going back and forth to Richmond trying to fight and advocate and go talk to the people that I was told I needed to talk to about why are you given this advantage and this monopoly to the casinos, let me explain to you how things are in our world and nobody would talk to me. So I didn't just didn't jump up one morning and decide, hey, let's go file a lawsuit. I went over there for almost three years yeah. and advocated, talked, tried to negotiate, whatever, and they just won't have it. And so they left the lawsuit as the only option. And I guess I was the only one that felt it was important enough to stand up and fight. But that was the only option left because I tried to go sit down like I've always been able to do things, get people in a room, just like we did last Thursday with Sadler Stanley Racing. You got a bunch of problems. Let's not talk to each other or about each other in different rooms. Let's put everybody, all the key figures together in a room that same thing that I have wished that legislators, casino lobbyists, Rosies, Churchill Downs, let's all get together in a room somewhere and go around and say, this is what I think is right. This is what I think is wrong. This is how it's affecting me. This is how we could work together. Let's at least have a conversation. But they are unwilling to do it. And for some reason, there's some people in the casino industry that have got the ear of the attorney general. And and somebody in the governor's office don't know why or how or whatever, but uh, we're fighting something way bigger than skill games right now. We're fighting about the Constitution and mm-hmm. people's rights and livelihoods and otherwise. So I think it's I do hope, as you can tell how you pissed me off and fired me up <laughs> talking about this. I do hope that the attorney general's office tries to somehow portray this to me as being something about money because it's the money from the casinos and their lobbyists and their investors that have bought the government and the Commonwealth of Virginia to get us to this point. So they're the ones with the money problem. Well, I'm going to be sitting next to you on Thursday. So uh, I, I hope I see this fiery passion uh, and, and demonstrated uh, when they start asking those questions, you, you know, they got to do it. And, and the thing is, is you were asking the question, why are, why, are, why do the casinos seem to have the ear of the attorney general's office and maybe part of the governor's office somewhere? Well, it's money. I mean, they, they've come in here. I mean, look at all the money they're paying right now to try to put uh, another casino in the city of Richmond. They had the opportunity to put one in Petersburg. Senator Joe Morrissey worked very hard to get that there. And then, but it was really, the casino said, we don't want to go to Petersburg. Petersburg is not a nice place. I guess that's what they thought. Petersburg is a great city. We want to be in downtown, the city of Richmond, and they are pouring like eight, 10, 15 million dollars in a referendum 
uh, just to get people to vote yes. And this is after Richmond City in the Commonwealth of Virginia, the capital of the Commonwealth, already voted no to a casino. And see, this is where I see the same thing. It's like the casinos are just like, we're not going to take no for an answer. We're just going to keep running this thing. We're going to get the politicians to go along with it. And we're going to run it until we get the vote we like, which is a yes vote. Which again is the bullying type tactics, the el- you know the sharp elbows, in my opinion, uh, all the way they deal with these things that they're going to dictate policy in Virginia. They're not going to let Virginia and Virginians dictate policy on how they're going to operate within the confines of our great state, and that just pisses me off because it's just not fair. We don't let any other industry do that. I mean, the closest that comes to us when the United States military uh, sets up its bases and sets up its, you know, ports and in, in on the eastern shore and and I get that because it's the federal government. But name another industry, Hermie, that that comes in and and pushes us around in our own backyard. Name one. And we just sit there and go, okay, well I guess you know those you know casinos win again. I mean, it, it makes no sense. It shows us to be weak as a state. And I think we need to step up and stand up and and protect Virginians. And that's what we're doing in this lawsuit. We've been successful. We're waiting on the Supreme Court. We've got a trial coming up in December no matter what. And then we're going to have the General Assembly session in January with at least one-third new House of Delegates and Senators who haven't been poisoned by this issue, have an open mind. Although, you know, I'm sure they're getting a lot of money from the casinos and, and those special interests. So who knows what we're going to have when we get back. But it just seems fair is what's required here and fairness is what is needed. So, well, I just think, as I've said many times, yes, this issue is skill games, but what we're fighting for is way bigger than that. I just don't know how we set up, allow a precedent that says you got enough money. You can go to Richmond and get, get your way and eliminate your competition through the government, not by out competing them in the free market system. And, and competing, that's when the people win. When businesses compete in the free market system, that's what forces them to have better prices, better services, better selection, better locations, all those things. That's what makes it better for the customer. When the government comes in and tries to you know, dictate who can operate a business and who doesn't, what incentive is it? For other businesses or those businesses that have those monopolies, what's their incentive to to be better? What's their incentive to hire the best people? What's their incentive to give the people the best benefit, their employees? What's the benefit to, you know, what's 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 motivating them to keep the bathrooms clean, to invest in new infrastructure? I mean, they don't. The government is saying this business is yours. You don't have to work for it. We're giving it to you because. You've thrown all this money around Richmond. The only people that benefits is the people that have the monopoly. It doesn't benefit other business owners and anybody who's going to spend money with or trade at these other locations because they have no, no incentive to be better. And it's got to hurt the restaurants that are around a, sure. a Rosie's if there's a restaurant there with the games or they're around yeah. the casinos. It's got to hurt the bars. Uh, you might get the ancillary, you know, people leaving the casino, going to a bar or restaurant afterwards, but they've got it all self-contained right there in the casino. So the established businesses, you know, of course you like every locality says, well, love the tax revenue, need the tax revenue. But if you look at it for the effort, it's not that much in my mind. They should, they got a sweetheart, in my opinion, tax uh, deal from the state. It could be, it should be, it must be more. The potential for, for skill games to bring hundreds of millions of dollars, both on the local and state level. I think that's part of what, in my opinion, the casinos fear because they know they can't generate that kind of tax revenue that can also be utilized by the state to police illegal gaming, the games of chance out there that are not inside the walls of the casino. I think what they fear is, is that all of a sudden they'll realize in our small businesses that it's much more profitable, much safer and uh, and better better managed as it was when it was you know first legalized and and overseen by the uh, Virginia Alcohol Beverage Control Board. I mean, it's I think what they fear is the success of what skill games can be for small businesses and for the Commonwealth and for the tax revenue. And so, uh, I think that your questions, in my opinion, if that's what they're saying, I mean, you know, I don't think you're an expert on determining First Amendment issues of you know you know uh, free speech. 
So they're going to start attacking your business and, and the taxes that you're not paying. And the taxes that you're not paying is only, you, you pay the income tax, the rate uh, in the state based on the revenue you generate there. But the income, you know, that you're not paying tax on is because the General Assembly, through these small, uh, these small special interest and just a small amount of General Assembly members, have kept tax revenue away from the Commonwealth of Virginia. So I don't think that's your fault. So if they're going to ask you about, you know, the success of your games or the money you're making or the greed or, you know, what the hell else are they going to ask you uh, that's really going to prove their case? Uh, and, you know, and we'll find out because we're going to prep tomorrow uh, with our uh, co-counsel, the great Jason Hicks, and we'll be getting ready. And, and we'll, what we'll do is we'll talk about that maybe this weekend uh, after your deposition when we're at South Boston. We'll do some recording there and we'll tell you what's going on. Maybe we'll have the Supreme Court decision that time. We can break it down for all those people that are interested about freedom and small business and, and the fight and the journey we've been on to protect both here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I just hope, I just hope people are paying attention, Bill, because this is way bigger than skill games. This sets a terrible precedent. This Right now, we could be skill games at issue, but if, if, the, if the message is that the government can, can pick winners and losers and it, has, it can be based on how much money you've got to come spend with the General Assembly and with legislators. And, and that, that is a scary proposition. Yeah. And that's why it's really important for us. We, you know, people might be saying, oh, here we go talking about skill games again. But look, you open the door, then it's the next thing that the government's going to take control of and choose big business and a monopoly over your rights and freedoms and your choice. And that should be very important to you especially in the free market system, which we're struggling to keep here with Bidenomics and everything else going on. Before we go and start leaning right, because I do want to bring up something with you, uh, just as we close out uh, the racing, we've been talking about racing and skill games. We're down to the round of eight. Four big names dropped off after the Roval this week in NASCAR's um, race for the championship here. Brad Keselowski, uh, Chastain. Before you ask me any questions, I did not watch the race and you had didn't? no idea. <laughs> Okay, this is going to be a very short segment. Who advanced and who didn't and why and what happened? Okay. I didn't watch you didn't. one second of it. Now, I was it? testing I was testing with Wyatt, my nephew, uh, over at Albemarle Cart Club in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, getting him up to speed in his new premier racing chassis. I did not watch one lap. Okay, well, so the ones that dropped off of those that are interested are Brad Keselowski, Brad, Chastain, Bush, and Bubba which I thought were pretty big names. And, and Bubba had it. Look, Bubba had a great run. I thought emotional one getting into the playoffs, trying to stick there. I mean, the, the cards were stacked against him in a lot because of that crazy points system. I, I was talking to a NASCAR, a former NASCAR driver who I will not name, who said, you know, he can't figure out the point system in the playoffs. And he said, uh, he said, man, whoever figured out the system was on drugs. And then he realized who, <laughs> who devised the system, which was, I guess what Brian France. So then he started giggling. And, uh, but you know, the final eight are there, we have, you know, Kurt Bush is, I mean, uh, Kyle Bush is out. That sucks. Bubba I hate to see him go. Ross Chastain, um, every year getting in there, at least he didn't do the, uh, the donut run around the Martinsville, the track to get in this time, but he was in there. Brad Keselowski, a big surprise joins Harvick and the others. And we're down to the final eight. So, um, you weren't there. It was Great a wild report. race. Great report. Bill. Thanks. Great report. <laughs> Thanks. I was going to talk to you about it. And there's nothing to talk about. Yeah. Don't talk racing with, with the uh, Herm. Uh, so tell me about Wyatt. How's he doing? I mean, he went from sports athlete, baseball and football. He's still playing or something baseball. Else. Okay. But, He's but playing baseball, but I remember your brother said that, that, you know, I guess cause the wife too, they didn't want their kids to get into racing here. White's got the, uh, genetic, uh, bug doesn't he to want to get a car he just kind of recently kind of a little bit surprisingly out of the blue decided he wanted to to uh just go ride some we've been to a couple tracks he has not raced yet probably won't actually if he races it won't be until next year but right now we're just taking him to different tracks and letting him get in the field for the tracks and and working on the carts and showing him how you do different things to the cart and how they drive differently and react to certain changes but i got to tell you i mean he it's really, we went to Capital City Speedway over in Ashland, Virginia uh, last week. This past Sunday, we went over to Elizabeth City to Albemarle. And I'm going to tell you, he really picks up the tracks fast. And if you go to my Facebook, Hermie Sadler, or mm -hmm. 
uh, on my Twitter page, uh, Elliot actually posted a video of Wyatt running a few laps. Yeah. At yeah, I saw that. Elizabeth City. And if you go back and look at that, if you know anything about racing, you know, because the, the cart goes by fast, so it's hard to really break it down. Mm -hmm. But watch his hands. His hands are so quiet on a steering wheel. And that's what you want. A lot of younger racers, when they're first starting, especially like in Wyatt's case, somebody that is just starting and doesn't know any better, when the cart gets a little bit sideways, typically for new drivers, their first inclination is they start hacking the wheel and correct and then overcorrect, start doing a sawing motion right. with the wheel. And that is a hard habit to break. But if you watch Wyatt race, he did the same thing in Capital City. And if you watch uh, the little video Elliot put up of him uh, riding uh, at Albemarle on Sunday, he goes through the corner with his hands at 10 and 2 and goes through the corner and his hands are quiet. They never move. Really? And so especially cart racers at that age group, when you're running an engine with a restrictor plate on it, you know, you the more you turn the front wheels, the more you scrub off speed. That you go slower. You want to keep that wheel as straight as you possibly can. And already with relatively no experience in a racing type of a cart like that, uh, he's got really soft hands and doesn't doesn't jerk the wheel a lot, if any, and that's a that's a that's a huge head start for him. That's amazing. And yeah, I saw that video. It looked great. And then I saw a video uh, on Facebook. You you definitely want to be a friend with Hermie Sadler Sadler on Facebook. It's never a dull moment. And it looked like uh your daughter and you were getting uh pedicure today pedicure yeah did you get your toes dead yeah you know those that know Haley, she loves wearing flip-flops she doesn't like to have socks on her feet nor shoes she loves flip-flops so yesterday morning when we got up and she was getting ready to go to work and i was getting ready to go to work it was a little bit chilly outside so i made her put on socks and sneakers so by the time lunchtime rolled around if she was at work at the oil company, so was I. She came and told me that her feet were hot. Hmm. And I said, do you know, need to get your, your toes done? She said, yes. So uh, because I made the mistake of making her wear tennis shoes and socks, I had to make up for that by taking her to get her feet done. And while I was there, I got mine done too, which really for her is a, is a big a big step forward for Haley because, you know, with the sensory issues that she has for her to allow somebody to, you know, to, to cut her toenails and do all that and, and do the pedicure was something she would not have always done, but her feet were hot because I made her wear tennis shoes. And so <laughs> we, me and her, uh, we went uh, yesterday afternoon and got our feet did mm. as we call it. Well, you got your toes did. I mean, how are they looking? I mean, you've got some, Fred Flintstone you feet there, buddy. You just wouldn't believe how cute they are. Did dude. you get a little lacquer and on I, the uh, nail? I've got, I've got clear, got clear, clear yeah. polish on. <laughs> I can't wait to show you on Saturday. I can't wait to see it. And make sure you wear. Let those... me guess. You're such, a, you're such a man's man that you've never had a pedicure. I've never had a pedicure. I've never had okay, a manicure so or a pedicure. That's your own fault. Well, I mean, you know, I was raised by a manly man who, you know, Navy guy. I mean, he didn't get a pedicure. I mean, you went to a barber shop. You didn't go to a hair salon. You know, there, there's things, I mean, hygiene is important. I wash my feet and I wash in between and I make sure, you know, I don't get the toe cheese, but I don't know if anybody wants to see my feet and my wife is, she's Laura, she hates feet. So wear a lot of socks around the house, but you know, you're going to have to pull off those beautiful Air Jordans that are decorated in our team colors. You're going to wear them to the race, I hope, um, and show me your, your pretty feet. Those, uh, those shoes were designed by my son Chandler. And got a pair for me and you and uh, and my wife and himself and uh, getting one for our champion, Bobby Labonte. So uh, I want to see what you're... <laughs> that sounds so creepy saying this. God, Hermie, I can't wait to see your feet on Saturday. Get pretty. Get pretty. <laughs> well, you know, I, I saw you you were taping her, but you weren't taping yourself getting a petty. I didn't hear any anybody I going... I showed my feet in the water. I showed my feet in the water. Oh, did you? I must have cut it off early. But uh, I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, that's psychologically uh, sound work for me. All right, so let's uh, let's let's well, next time next time that I'm in your company and we have a few extra minutes, we're going to get a go go get a pedicure. Okay. All right. Fine. You could get me to do that. 
All right, you yeah. could get me to do that. All right, I'll do it, and we'll film it or we'll record it, and maybe sure we'll we play will. it on the podcast. Sure, we will. Because if we're anything in a in, in a manicure shop like we are in a court of law, it's bound to be funny because you and I can make each other laugh in those kind of situations. All right, that's a deal. We'll do, we'll do it. We'll do a field trip to get a pedicure, my first ever, and we'll record it. Okay. Now let's uh, before we go, we've been we've been talking about racing, talking about skill games. You got to talk about, uh, you know, my heart goes out to the people of Israel right now. We're, we're going to be leaning right here. We've been turning left on, uh, on uh, racing here. But, man, I mean, what do you think about what's going on in Israel? Over a thousand people killed. Uh, horrible attacks on Israel. Israel wasn't doing anything to Gaza. Um, and, and it's a war. And here we go again with another war. And we've got one in Eastern Europe with Ukraine and Russia. And now we've got Iran proxy through Hamas attacking Israel and you know I'm a Republican and and I know the Israelis will fight like hell to protect themselves because never again is their mantra but here we go you know the United States failed policies kind of get us into these positions or get other countries in these positions we didn't have this problem during Donald Trump but it just seems to be like everybody's bolder and thinks they can get away with things whether it's the terrorists of Hamas or uh, the Russians in Ukraine it, it is just so sad to see and the barbary the barbaric way that the Hamas uh, cowards are raping and killing women and beheading children, taking hostages, killing people at a music festival. I mean, just sickens me to my stomach. And, and that's all you see on TV right now. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's heartbreaking. And you already said it, but what is partly to blame is a lack of strength and leadership by. Joe Biden and his administration. I was just sitting here as we were recording. It's it's three thirty on Tuesday afternoon. Just a few moments ago, uh, Joe Biden finally made a statement on TV, uh, and that's probably because he got shamed into talking because he didn't. You know, he should have been way out in front of this or ahead of it, and he's you know, a couple of days later finally coming out and, and making a comment, but it's, well, and then they've, then he's disappeared for two days. Now they've called a lid, which is like, uh, they won't let any more access. The president won't be uh, involved in any activities publicly or otherwise for two days. I mean, after one statement that he made over the weekend, I think Sunday morning, well, he, you he, just, seen he just talked on TV Oh, did he? today. I was, I was watching, uh, watching the TV. So about three o'clock on Tuesday, you know, is when he finally stood up in front of, of course he didn't answer any questions because he never does. But um, just weakness, and people are taking advantage of it, and they know that uh, w- you know, that we're we're you know it's just we just project weakness in every possible way, and uh, my heart goes out to the people of Israel, and I- I'm like you, I see what I see the the videos on, on TV and with the kids, the kids is what really gets to me. I'm sure it does to you as well. Yeah. Um, it's all, it's all terrible, but you see what they're dealing with. And it's, uh, it's just a shame that we didn't do more prior to this and don't show any more strength than we do. Um, immediately after something like this happens. Yeah. And I mean, I'm just reading the, uh, you know, just the, the headlines here, the New York post. Biden confirms 14 Americans killed by Hamas. Others are taken hostage. You've got Hamas kills 40 babies and children, beheading some of them at Israeli kibbutz. Kibbutz is like a commune, a Jewish commune. Um, You know, and then what you've got in the gall of this is that, you know, everybody should realize that this is an attack on a sovereign nation. And yet we're even seeing some of the, the squad like Ilhan Omar and, and some of their other people sitting there saying, hey, oh, well, de-escalation, Israel should just take it. They should de-escalate. And then they're even calling, you know, Israel an apartheid state when it comes to the Gaza Strip, which is so ill-informed because in Gaza, which is, you know, if you're looking, it's a Western part of, um, of that part of Israel uh, controlled by the Palestinians, governed by Hamas. And Israel has always given them free electricity and free water. And has not been messing with them. They got a fence, and, and they're the ones that came across the line and brutally attacked Israelis during one of the high holy days of the Jewish faith. You know, th- these require responses, and, and, and Iran is behind it. 
you know, Rand's, you know, they've said, oh, they're complicit. They have everything to do with it. Uh, and, you know, the policies, and again, we want Israel to live free and without violence, but we've given over, you know, $16, $17 billion just in recent months to Iran for the exchange of hostages. And, and you know, Iran says, oh, we'll promise us to only use it for humanitarian efforts. And then they basically said, when this started, no, we'll use it any way that we want to, which you know is going to this proxy war that they're fighting Israel, that they're afraid of Israel actually having a normalized relationship with Saudi Arabia and some of the other Arab nation states, that how that uh, creates peace in the Middle East, which in which Iran believes in disruption. But then you've got they're congressmen playing, just they're, sitting they're there. playing a replay right now of, uh, or got someone's commentating and was showing a replay of President Biden's comments, and it just makes me feel much better that Kamala Harris is standing behind him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's uh, what an intimidating crowd uh, to tell those Iranians to back off. I mean, they've basically given them billions of dollars, and then they have people in their Democrat party that are that are basically saying that Israel ha- holds, you know, Gaza in an apartheid state, which is total BS. And then, you know, it even drops down to our friends in the in the Virginia State Legislature, Senator Scott Servell, when everybody's speaking support for evil uh, for Israel, uh, my wife uh, put out "I stand with Israel" on her Facebook page. Scott Servell puts out on his Facebook page, blaming, I mean, how this guy could, and he's a friend of mine. I've known him since we started being lawyers way before we ever were elected politicians. But he conflates issues and says, well, you know what this, this is, Hamas's attack is caused by Netanyahu, and, and, and it just shows the same way that, you know, Republicans and what we're doing in the House of Representatives and the takeover or, or the replacement of the Speaker of the House, uh, he conflates the two, and, and listen to this. He says, the division and distraction created by Netanyahu's judicial power grab created an opportunity for these attacks. In the same way, House Republicans' civil war creates opportunities for other countries to take advantage of American disorganization. What the hell are you talking about, Scotty? The, f- the hell's wrong with you, man? I mean, so, so again, he's blaming Netanyahu for, for Israel being attacked. And then he he conflates the two and compares it to, and this is why we're a weaker country, because the Republicans in the House of Representatives removed their speaker. I mean, this is how they think. This is like Ilhan Omar and and, and the other members of the squad, um, you know, AOC and those kind of things who, who blame Israel. And, you know, I hope Israel goes and kicks their ass because these guys have awakened the slumbering giant and they should get their butts kicked for what they did and how they... I just with depravity have have killed women, raped women and children, and and beheaded them. Oh, sick, just totally sick. But the here United we go. States Virginia has General Assembly has, has to support and has to do it quickly and swiftly. Uh, and I just hope people are paying attention. You know, I know people could get so caught up as I went through. You know, running for office, and people are so, you know, they want to know, they want to try to catch you saying something on a, on an issue that's important to them, and you know, to get so into the weeds of politics and all this other stuff. And all that's important, but swift, decisive leadership yeah. is so important. And being in a position where when you tell somebody something, they know that, that you mean what you say and say what you mean and have those kind of people around you. And we just look we just look so weak as it's actually an embarrassment for uh, how we're being portrayed on the uh, the national and the world stage right now. It's really, really disappointing and scary. Um, but my heart, as I said before, goes out to the people of Israel, and I hope they are they get the support um, they need to protect themselves because it's uh, it's unfortunate and it's uh, it's sad as you and as you said the the constant reminders on TV is. Um, one of the scariest things I've seen, oh. and um, yeah, and the it, wrong person in charge. Yeah, that's all and, another day. And we we look weak in our response, and it looks like when we were cl- kind of like playing footsie with Iran, not just in the money that we handed over to them, but also trying to re-engineer, you know, the nuclear deal with them. I mean, they just treat us like fools because we are fools. And look, they've they've sent uh, munitions. They're saying. There may even be munitions that have come from Afghanistan and the Taliban uh, that uh, that we had left in Afghanistan and that horrible withdrawal from uh, from Afghanistan when uh, Biden did that nine day withdrawal and 
and and just it was a debacle and many people died from that um you know, we've seen again and again the world stage, the bad actors of the world stage are not afraid of the United States. And, you know, look, love him or hate him with Donald Trump, uh, they were, you know, maybe maybe everybody in North Korea and Russia and, and Iranians thought he was crazy, and that's why they were afraid to act, because they know he would have been strong. But what I see is, you know, Joe Biden comes out today, I guess, after being, you know, hidden for a couple of days and says, oh, this is deplorable, this is horrible. Well, that's not really a lot of action. And I've heard we've moved some of our ships. Yeah, we know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. This is awful. Uh, we moved some ships into the Mediterranean, but it's really to protect our own interests, not to assist uh, uh, Israel. And then you've got Democrats saying don't give support to Israel, but wanting to pour billions of dollars into Ukraine uh, because of, once again, I don't know what their hatred of, of, of Jews is or why they think Israel uh, is an oppressor state. Uh, quite frankly, I've always said, look, when it came to Palestine, you know, Palestinians and the two nation state, two state nation, if they had the two nation states together, working together, they'd be the most powerful thing in the Middle East if they could work together. And that's why a lot of these Middle East countries don't want to work or don't want them to work together or ever be friends or ever work as a unified thing because they'd be so powerful. It's, you know, and instead you get this chaos and, and I don't know why liberals, um, um, always uh, blame the Israelis and, and the Jewish state is out of bounds and it should not happen. We need to stand and support our, uh, um, our Judeo brothers and sisters and we need to let them go uh, exact, exactly what they need to in order to protect themselves and make sure this doesn't happen again. It would be, and what I say, and please Democrats, stop your nonsense. Please Scotty Serval, stop your nonsense. Because quite frankly, you know, if you'd said something so stupid like that dangerous. at nine eleven, I mean, you know, it's like, oh, we deserved it. I mean, you you would never be able to say something. Nobody ever believes that. Oh yeah, the United States deserved nine eleven to what our policies were, and, and the House of Representatives controlled by Republicans. Get Reckless out of here! Dangerous. Just get the frig out of here, man. Go back to trying to run a race and beat us in the Senate and get control. Uh, but again, this is another, I think, indication in my mind of why Democrats should not be in control of government. I mean, look what they do. They break down the social strata and the, and the family. They, they indoctrinate our children. They, they try to tell us, you know, that, uh, that we can't be as free as we should be. And they don't protect the common man anymore. They go with big corporations. All the things that they used to think about in the 60s and 70s, being for the, you know, the little guy, not anymore. Uh, being for freedom and free expression, not anymore. And being for making sure that we all live in peace. Not anymore, because they are warmongers in so many ways, in my opinion. Supporting Ukraine in an endless war without any resolution in sight. And now uh, not backing Israel and saying stupid stuff like my friend Scott Servell just did. Uh, making politics out of what is a tragedy in the world. And we should be doing everything we can to defeat terrorism. They've hit our shores. I'm worried. I mean, Herm, don't you think? I'm a little worried they're going to, um, you know, they're going to be basically, uh, you know, they may be doing terrorist attacks here as well. Yes. Uh, it's, we don't project strength. We don't, we don't appear to be strong. We're always reacting instead of being proactive. Uh, leadership starts at the top and, you know, people just don't pay attention. People are, are we're just not strong. And, the people that we are supposed to be supporting can't feel a hundred percent comfortable in, in the support we can show because we got so many of our own problems here. And then we are facing more and more problems abroad. And we've, uh, we've just got to take care of ourselves and, and be in position to help our allies more and, and put common sense back to work. I mean, that's what I hope people yep. are paying attention to not only in the elections here in Virginia, you know, uh, next month, but when we get into next year, I mean, I hope, I hope people are just paying attention and educate themselves because, uh, we're, we're headed in a, in a bad way, in a bad direction fast. Yep. And there's that prayer and we'll close with this, uh, that the Israeli defense force <clears throat> is praying. It's their defense when they go to war, uh, against attackers who try to annihilate them. And as they always say, never again. And the prayer is as follows. He who blessed our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless the fighters of the Israeli Defense Force who stand guard over our land and the cities of our God from the border of the Lebanon to the desert of the Egypt and from the great sea unto the approach of the Avara on the land 
in the air and in the sea. May Hashem cause the enemies who rise up against us to be struck down before them. May the Holy One, blessed is He, preserve and rescue our fighting men from every trouble and distress and from every plague and illness. And may He send blessings and success into every endeavor that they engage in. May He lead our enemies under the sway and may He grant them salvation and crown them with victory. And may there be fulfilled for them the verse, for it is you, for it is Hashem, your God, who goes with you to battle your enemies for you to save you. Everybody respond, Amen. And now they are on the move and they will take out these bloody terrorists and these, and this is evil from this, from their nation and the time has come to fight. And so we support Israel. Our, our hearts are with you. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. And for anyone in this United States who, who uh, is on the side of Palestine or, or who says, or blames Israel, I don't want to hear from you. Just, you know, you have the right to say whatever you want in America, but that's enough. Go on back to your hole, go on and back to, you know, to your place with your pride flags and uh, go be liberal on some other issue. Okay. So sorry about that, Herm, but we pray for those soldiers. We pray for Israel and we pray for those families and those Americans uh, who are hostage and for their families who have lost loved ones there from these attacks. Uh, Amen. Brother Hermie, it's always good to talk to you, but I don't like doing this by, uh, by remote. Let's be together this weekend as we run for Sobo. Uh, we run for the checkers with uh, Bobby Labonte, maybe Ryan Newman, and definitely Jonathan Cash. Maybe a three-card duo, just or triplet. Well, it's not a duo, is it? It's a three-card tri- trifecta. You're so excited about the possibility of three cars going in a circle, you don't know what to do. Exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we appreciate you listening. Uh, tell your friends and, and have them listen as well. You can always find us at uh, www.sadlerstanleyracing.com. You can look up our podcast. We have a website there, uh, leaningrightandturningleft.com. You can see us and find us on Facebook, social media. Uh, that is Leaning Right and Turning Left Podcast. And then uh, Sadler SS Racing uh, Facebook page. And then uh, the infamous uh, Twitter, X now, uh, formerly Twitter, uh, handle Sadler Senator, at Sadler Senator for all your updates, man. We appreciate you listening. We love you bunches, and uh, we love all the feedback, so keep it coming. Tell us what we're doing right. Tell us what we're doing bad. And maybe next week, maybe, just maybe, we might see the old Shepherd, the old Shepherd, come back. And then we'll be able to say, Shep, Shep, Mom, Shep, Mom, come on back, Shep, we'll miss you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, and I'm leaning right. I'm Hermie Sadler, and I'm turning left. Thanks for listening. Thanks to, for all the support, and thanks to Pacematic. This is Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. We'll see you next week. God bless you all. <laughs>Conrad Thompson with SaveWithConrad.com. You've heard me bragging on the podcast for years about helping people save money on their current house, but did you know that I can help you with your next house as well? That's right. We can get you into your next house with zero down. No money down loan programs are still available, and I know it sounds too good to be true, but we can do it for you. And by the way, home ownership is more affordable than you might think. We routinely turn renters into homeowners, and we hear back that their new house payment is more affordable than what they were paying in rent. Why would you keep doing that? Stop throwing your money away, paying for someone else's mortgage, and start building wealth for your family. And let my family help at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit to do this. We can improve credit scores down to the 500s, and it's worth mentioning, we never say no. We say not yet, but here's how. You need a game plan to buy a house, and that's where we come in at SaveWithConrad.com. We'll ask you, what down payment do you want to make? And zero is an acceptable answer. And what monthly payment do you want? And then it's time to go shopping. Find out how easy it is and how affordable it is to become a homeowner at SaveWithConrad.com.